I've forgotten. Um, I'm Ruth Rodade from the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, and I've had a, uh, uh, I have to thank, um, well, the organizers, the center and everything, because uh, I've learned so much about Iran today. Um, my field is, um, that's not me, it's not me. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, my field is the social and cultural history of the Middle East, and most recently I've been working on gender um, in the Middle East. And um, I have to say that I owe it to the women of Iran that I, that I even learned about Iran, because when I started studying Middle Eastern studies, we didn't learn about Iran at all. But when I started teaching gender, I had no choice. You know, the women of Iran had played such a crucial role and visible role in the revolution and since then that I had to start learning something about Iran. But I came early this morning, actually. They were kind enough to let me come last night so that I could learn more about Iran. And I want to thank all the speakers and participants this morning because they really, um, I learned a lot from them. Um, I, I want to pick up on something that Mayor... Uh, Litvak said just by accident this morning, that it wasn't part of his planned talk. He said, I say men, but I really, it's not really a politically correct term. I think you said something like that. You were talking about Locke or something like that. Uh, I say men, but of course, you know, whenever I say men, I mean everybody, you know. They, 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 say, men. they say men. No, no, you were talking about Locke. Of course, Locke was talking when he said men, he meant men. And I was thinking. Uh, in in two, the year 2000, if I'm not correct, there's so many experts on Iran here. Uh, women in Iran, I hope I'm right about the year, women in Iran decided to run uh, for the presidency. Um, my friend and colleague, Shala Hairi from Boston University, uh, made a documentary film about interviewing uh, I think about five or six of the women, it's unbelievable, like 22 women ran, were candidates for the presidency. Well, um, nobody thought that they were going to get elected, but the purpose of their running for election was to get, to get a, uh, have a decision made that the word Rajul in Persian, I don't have Persian, the word Rajul in Persian does not mean man. It means, I think she, I think she says honorable person. Well, I come from Arabic, I said, you know, come on, of course it means, you know. And the more I thought about it, I said, you know, wait a minute, maybe, you know, uh, maybe there is something to that, you know, because in my work I ran into a uh, um, science called Ilma Rajul, uh, the science of, of men, but it also deals with women. So maybe it really means the science of illustrious people, and maybe, I don't know, did they... What the, what the outcome of, was, of this thing, but the, but the documentary is quite interesting. Uh, so on that note, we're moving from the, the men Rajul to the women Rajul. And um, uh, one of our participants, um, well, we're in the, the 21st century, so let's, you know, let's say the real reason. She's pregnant and she can't. Um, you know, she's bedridden, we all wish her the best, and uh, uh, we'll celebrate the birth, hopefully celebrate the birth of her child, just like we celebrate the birth of our books. Um, you know, uh, the genesis of, uh, of a child is, comes out in nine months. Books frequently take longer, um, as I've learned. Um, so, uh, so there are only two speakers today, but two excellent speakers. Uh, and I don't want to take too much of their time, even though I was asked to make some comments at the end, and we'll see how time runs. We're running late. Uh, our first uh, speaker is um, uh, Professor Shirazi from uh, University of Texas, where I have some very good friends. And uh, Professor Shirazi is the author of a book called Veil Unveiled, Hijab in Modern Culture from University of Florida. 2001. She will speak on. Uh, she will. Sp if I can find it, I'll tell you. I have the wrong page. Thank you. Oh, that sounds interesting. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just teasing. I saw it before. Women, 
women imagery used in 1979 Islamic Revolution and Iran Iraq War. Wow. Please. It's a very technological session, but visual. Good afternoon. My name is Faida Shirazi, and I was freaking out up to five minutes ago <laughs> because my CD doesn't work. <laughs> I realized that all my images were the cropped images, but we managed to get some images for presentations. But um, just want to apologize ahead of time that once you think that you are completely ready, you're never ready. Right. But, and I made them ready four months ago. Um, today I'm going to talk about the woman imagery used in 1979, Islamic Re Revolution, and also during the Iran-Iraq War. Um, let me just read you one little... Um, uh, paragraph here just to set the stage um, for you. It's about the campaign of unveiling Iranian women which was done by force during the reign of Reza Shah who ruled from 24 to 1933 and it was among his uh, most ambitious projects for modernization of Iranian women and he calls that emancipation of Iranian women. Nearly 70 years later, during 1979, the leader of the Islamic Revolution of Iran, Ayatollah Khomeini, who claimed the same thing, who toppled Pahlavi dynasty, revealed women by force also, and claimed he was also emancipating women uh, of Iran by returning their dignities. So, uh, I just want you to picture that in your head, that um, 70 years before, they were forcefully unveiled, and they were told that they are emancipated, and the same women were used 70 uh, years later, and they were forcefully put the veil on, and they were also emancipated. So, in between, there are two extreme forms of emancipation that we're talking about. Um, the aim of my study was to look at the posters and the stamps that they were published during the era between 1979, and, uh, which was the Islamic Republic Revolution, and the following years of the 1980 to 1988, which was during the time of Iran-Iraq War. And why did I want to study this? I wanted to study the mannerism in which women's images were presented, not only the way that they were dressed, but the extended roles that they were assigned in these imageries. And um, they were supposed to behave in different terms, in ethical and social terms new realities. So I started to look at the campaign which has started um, on the woman and the very first document that, um, which I would call it, you know, an official document, is the decree of Imam Khomeini. Um, the decree of Imam Khomeini who um, said it that um, there would be regulations um, about the women's images and how they're supposed to be um, presented themselves in the public arena. In this manner, we have posters, banners, postage stamps. Um, they all taught women of Iran um, what is the correct way to dress herself up in the public how is the correct way to behave socially, and what is her social roles and ethical behavior. This era is filled with noticeable semantic fusion 
of the hijab, which is the veiling, and the jihad, which is the holy war, in the context of the martyrdom. So we have three different motifs going at the same time. Hijab, jihad, and martyrdom. Images created political and religious events. Um, they were depicted, and they gave rise to a high-quality art, and later on, to an innovative ways of presenting images of Iranian women in the newly established Islamic Republic of Iran. The images through the art, its very remarkable characteristics of material culture of the Islamic Revolution in Iran, and it was um, it is application of textual messages with images or just the images without the text, which they were really didn't need any text to describe. They were so powerful messages. And these messages meant to communicate, and it's really remarkably did, to communicate religious and political messages, not only internally among the Iranian population, but also outside the Iranian borders across the globe. And I question how this was done. How can these messages be by images across the globe? Well, there are many different ways that they thought about that. First is by combining artistic talent and collective and constructed myths. In addition to symbolism motifs, which was shared in the Iranian sacred history, and how did they do that? Well, those went on the postage stamps. And the postage stamps were done very cleverly. Um, there were certain kinds of stamps that is only for foreign. Uh, it's used for the abroad because they have a different price. And then deliberately, the very powerful messages were printed on those stamps. So when these stamps were placed on the parcels or the envelopes, and they will travel from Iran to across the globe, those images will carry a lot of messages. And they were very colorful. And what did this achieve? It mobilized not only the entire nation to react to two separate but closely related events. First was the revolution in 79 and the imposed war with Iraq, as is understood and is always referred to as imposed war, um, when Iranian government refers to Iran-Iraq war. The imposed war because they invaded Iran, and the war was imposed on the Iranians rather than we invading them. Um, and in this reality, what was the contributions of the graphic artist Painter's services. In both events, which is the revolution and the war, the, the war graphic artists and painters were employed to cleverly create nationalistic posters filled with familiar religious symbolism and written messages that affected a spectator's religious and nationalistic emotions. And what was the mediums that these um, art presentations were presented? The medium, there were sources. First of all, in order to be effective, you really had to know um, the culture of the people. So proverbs, religious slogans, graffitis, poetry, any emotional religious sentiments that a lay person in Iran, it doesn't have to be highly educated, you know, complicated messages, because this meant to be um, appealing to the masses. And the masses were the important people, because those are the ones who will mobilize so they appeared on posters, but is also in, was inclusive in this medium was the murals on the walls, the graffitis, the slogans on the walls, which will be in a 
many different ways, banners, and the proverbs and poems, and then audio and video cassettes, bank notes, postage stamps, even product boxes, and wrappers for chewing gums and box candies, they all carried messages. So you were not able to escape these messages. You turn the TV on, message is there, listen to radio is there, look around the city is there, buy a stamp is there, spend your money is constantly a reminder because messages are there. Thus, we can agree that this well-orchestrated, semiological and dramatic, uh, dra The, this semiological and symbolism and the dimensions of these images is a um, fascinating subject which deserves really um, a great, more maybe in-depth, a social psychological perspective, a study. They're not just pictures. Um, among the other scholars who had also studied um, very closely these posters, um, are, uh, first is Peter Tchaikovsky and Hamid Dabashi, and also uh, two other scholars by the name of Mehdi Abedi and Michael Fisher. They also had to study um, to a certain, to, with the differences in their approach, but they all had to study the same images. Um, in Tchaikovsky, uh, he has a very interesting book called a Staging a Revolution, The Art of Persuasions in the Islamic Republic of Iran, and he had really in-depth had studied all the posters. They all agree on the importance of how public sentiments and collectively held sim symbolics are used to mobilize a group of people for a radical and revolutionary purposes. Of course, um, this change was not possible if the symbolism was not placed in the context of Shi'i faith and the concept of the Iranian history. In order for people to understand the meaning, it's not only the Shi'ism, but also the concept of the Iranian history and how the Shi'ism is not only the religion at some point, is a more of a culture and it's a culture that every single person in Iran will understand. What is the central message on these pictorial messages? Is the ideology of God-centered rather than the human-centered. It's a worldview that is a God-centered, it's not a human-centered. Both Tchaikovsky and Dabashi refer to this form of, quotations, art, as the rather than a fine art, if it's not a fine art, they call it a furious art. So it, it is art, but it's a very exclusive form of art. The Museum of Furious Art, as they refer to it, uh, it has a fantastic collections. There are so many posters that they were done during this time. The Iran of 1980s, a nation is in revolution and war with an invader. The nation that remaking itself in images and forms and shapes and colors, frames of anger and anxieties. That's how they refer to this museum of furious art. Although Tchaikovsky and Dabashi examined posters and imagery of this time and during this time era, I'm just um, focused on one particular aspect of these um, images. And this is what I have done. I have looked at these images with a different eye. I have looked at these images as how they have exploited to facilitate the Islamic message of revolution along with the war of Iran and Iraq during the 80s and how they have used the images of women to carry part of this burden for, for the government. There are numerous overlap and fusion between um, 
socialist, nationalist, and religious ideas in these images. Many roles are assigned to Iranian women through these images. And what are those roles? Women are depicted not only in their normative domestic duties, but they are extended. Their duties have been extended, first like a young revolutionary fighting for the sake of Islam, Second image, mother of a young revolutionary soldier of the Islamic army who will send with agreement um, her own son to the front. Third, she is the daughter of a revolutionary a fa whose father, um, despite of his old age, volunteered for the war. So she is also the daughter of a volunteer. She is also a follower of an exemplary female religious figure, Fatima al-Zahra, who is the beloved daughter of the Prophet Muhammad. Um, and she will do this with love and dedication, with a domestic life duty. Other image of the Iranian woman on these um, imageries is that the new revolutionary woman also would follow the example of Zainab, the granddaughter of the Prophet Muhammad, who is known as the lioness of Karbala. And Zainab is the sister of Imam Hussein, the son of Imam Ali, the leader of the Shi's um, followers. And Hussein, in the collective memory of Shi'i people, is known as Sayyid al Shahada, the master of the martyrs. This is for some of you that may not know these all in details. Thus, as it is evident from what I said already, suddenly the Islamic Revolution of 1979 and the Iran-Iraq War expanded the roles that are played by the Iranian woman at least through the depiction of the images of her newly assigned duties. There is one um, important um, sermon that Khomeini had and I has this translation that I'm going to read for you. Actually, there are a lot of dates that they changed on the occasions of the anniversary of this martyrdom and that martyrdom. One of the dates that it was changed was the date of the, um, the Women's Day in Iran. They decided the Women's Day in Iran would be April 25th, which is um, designated as the Women's Day, and I don't know how they got that information about, it's a um, Fatima Zahra's birthday. So, on the occasion of the April 25th of 1981, this is very important sermon because it is stamped um, something in the woman's life in Iran. And here's what Khomeini said for the Iranian woman. You respected ladies are charged with bringing up pious children. Your job is to rear pious children and deliver them to the society. You should bring up children who will safeguard the prophet's wishes and aspirations. The assistance of the women is many times more valuable than that of men. May God protect you in bringing up human beings the job of the prophets. Why is this so important? As noted, this is a very strong statement which will be reminded women of Iran constantly as what are her real duty in traditional Islamic society. Bringing up and rearing children and delivering them to the kingdom of the prophet. So, in other words, creating children pious enough that they will be willingly volunteer to be martyrs for the war. And this is 1981. The ideal woman who raises pious children for the kingdom of the prophet was adored and admired and was reminded constantly in the speeches. The graphic artist hurried to put words in the visual images on the posters along with the evangelic words of advice, quoting Khomeini, saying it over and over again. 
The ideal woman then was plastered all over Iran to promote the war with Iraq. There's one interesting issue that I had raised that also I talked about that in my, one of the chapters in my book about the Iranian politics and hijab. The interesting point is, the principle of the Iranian constitution forbids the private sector to use any woman's images in commercials, for services, and goods yet. The Islamic Republic of Iran freely used veiled images of women. And I always question that. Veiled images of women were, are, is the same images that nobody else is supposed to use for the commercial purposes. And I once was asked, what do you mean by commercial purposes? I always say, if you, if you pay to receive services or purchase something, it's consumerism, isn't it? Or it's not. This is the basic definition of consumerism. Then I, as a customer, go to the post office. Do I have a choice to buy any other postage stamps except what government puts up, right? So if the image of the woman is on that postage stamps, wouldn't that make me a consumer because I'm paying money for that stamp? So how come, in that respect, her image, her veiled image, is okay? It's not going to be considered consumerism. But of course, the ideological cause for the Islamic government of Iran was different because this is a religious, you know, presentations. Um, Fatima al-Zahra, through very effective and powerful in words, were not strategically strong enough at some point to stop the war and regain the Iranian territories. Thus, the government needed the uh, tragedy of Karbala at this point to save the lasting battles against the army of Iraq. The theme of martyrdom played an integral part in Shia Islam also played a central role in the revolution and the Iranian and Iraq war. So, in looking at all that, we have another Khomeini's speech on the martyrdom, because this is also very remarkable and important mention about the martyrdom and how it gave rise to many, multiple of these images. And here's his um, speech. Think about the fact that the best people at the time of Imam Hussein, His Holiness, the Lord of the Martyrs, and the best youths of Bani Hashem, who is the tribe of the Prophet, and his best followers were martyred, leaving this world through martyrdom. Yet, when the family of Imam Hussein was taken to the evil presence of Yazid, her uh, lioness, Zainab, peace be upon her, said, and this is what Zainab said, what we experienced was nothing but beautiful. So the motive of martyrdom as beautiful event was glorified. Okay, so the reason I'm quoting these two important sermons from Khomeini, one is for the issue of martyrdom, and the other one was for the issue of the um, uh, raising children for the kingdom of the prophet. Now, women as martyrs. Now, women did not go to the front, but they are seen as the martyrs. This motif of women of martyrs, this beautiful experience of martyrdom, was glorified over and over again in many different ways, textually, visually. Women became martyrs, in quotations, by supporting the martyrdom of the male family, every member of the male families, and they were supposed to be receiving the news about their death with graciousness and with pride. Government rewarded the families of martyrs by providing for them. Of course, women supporting the war by supporting the men, and that was glorified over and over again. So that it will go back to rearing 
the children for the kingdom of the prophet. Um, woman is standing behind men um, as physical power for watching you know, them going to the front and knowing the fact that they are going to be martyred and they should not expect them back, but they should be very proud of this fact. So what I have done, which is unfortunately I do not have my beautiful 15 <laughs> wonderful images, uh, but I am very grateful for big help that I received here in the last second. I will be showing you some of these um, images.
which is green. And on the top of it, it says, Ya Zahra. O you Zahra, Fatima al Zahra. That means, you remember the sermon for the Khomeini I have recited for you, for the kingdom of the prophet. So, the mother raises the children for the kingdom of the prophet. The role mother is Fatima al Zahra, because she also gave a martyr. And this is on the Defai Mubaddas, which is the sixth year anniversary of recapturing the city of Khoram Shah. Um, in this, it is so clear there are three male generations. An elderly man, which is in the middle and is depicted by the white beard. A young teenager to his right. And a young man with a black beard, which would be her husband. So this is woman behind these three men. Although the glorified images are the men, but if you're looking at it from my perspective, the important figure in here is that woman who is giving her blessing and support to these three men in his own in her own family. Poetry, 
and calligraphy, uh, both integral to the Iranian culture, they constructed their works on the basis of religious, mystical, mythological, and poetic themes in order to facilitate communication of the intended messages. Women played a large part in this process. Images of women, from the cultural point of view, were explored at times, exploited, and then were employed to serve the governmental political agenda. Her ordinary motherly and domestic roles were expanded to become a supporter of war by standing firm behind her male family members who were going to war, and many disdained to become martyrs. She also became a martyr in her own right by giving a martyr to the war. Her role was expanded also to become a fearless fighter by walking the, the path of historical Zainab, uh, giving or participating in revolutionary speeches, mobilizing an army of sisters of Zainab. In addition to all that, the Iranian woman was expected to follow the role model of Fatima al-Zahra, reinforcing the ideology of loving mother, a compassionate, obedient wife, a kind daughter, a wonderful sister in her parental life, in her personal life. She also had to become a public ambassador for her nation, not only nationally, but internationally as well, when uh, she had to achieve in these in two manners. First, by visual projections of her religious piety, and second, by her ethical behavior as an honorable, chaste woman in the public arena to her veil. Both, ta uh, both tasks became possible by dressing herself in an accepted form of public hijab. Veiling, which is sanctioned by, the Islam, uh, sanctioned by the Islamic Republic of Iran, in that role, her image was plastered everywhere, and she was open to gaze of millions of spectators. Looking at her image, plastered all around in her veil, Truly, I truly admire this woman who became everything that a nation in trouble really needed. <laughs> Thank you very much. Despite technical difficulties, it was a really fascinating talk. Um, while they're getting organized, um, when uh, uh, the mothers of martyrs who were not allowed to cry were mentioned, it brought to mind um, one of my colleagues, Dr. Nadira Shalhub Kvorkian, who through the use of voice therapy with Palestinian mothers of martyrs, um, got them through voice therapy to get past this, I'm so happy that I gave a martyr to the nation, and then, and, and at a certain point, they were able to break down and start crying and tell their real story about how, how they weren't allowed to mourn their sons, how they had to sneak off to the cemetery to visit them. Very fascinating. She published it as an article. She herself is a therapist. But just that's just a little uh, comparative uh, thing. I'll uh, give the microphone uh, to Leora. Um, uh, from the home team, she's um, uh, doing. Uh, she's completed or submitted actually a PhD on uh, women's journalism and the representation of women uh, here at Tel Aviv University. And uh, uh, can you see it? Like, just, just waiting, waiting for the good news okay. to break out the show. <laughs> In the winter of 1966. An urgent phone call was made by Sheikh Muhammad Taki Falsafi, a member of the Hujatiya Society. The Hujatiya Association was founded in the aftermath of the coup d'etat of 1953 and the overthrow of Muhammad Mossadegh's government. Its explicit goal was to train cadres for the scientific defense of Shiite Islam in the face of Baha'i theological challenge. But that winter of 1966, Falsafi was not troubled with the Baha'i challenge, but with an entirely different challenge. 
the cause of falsafia disturbance was a series of articles published in Iran's most popular magazine at that time, Zaneruz. Zaneruz, literally, today's woman, or the modern woman, was a glossy commercial magazine. The Kehan's Group Publishing House began its publication in mid-1960s. The new magazine was designated to family and to women. However, from its first issue, published during the spring of 1965, the magazine has enjoyed large readership and with time became the most popular magazine in Iran, as we can gather from its estimated circulate rate. Under the enforced modernization process initiated by Mohammad Reza Shah, culminating in 1963 White Revolution, Zana Ruz adopted a format and style of Western women's magazines such as Mademoiselle and Elle. In fact, even large quantity of Zana Ruz content was borrowed from the Western media. As such, the magazine covered a wide range of topics, including royal court news, articles, historical accounts, translated fiction, gossip, advice columns, opinion columns, commentaries, reviews, matchmaking, astrology, crossroad puzzles, etc. Despite its uh, uh, sensational inclinations and apparent soft tabloid features, Zanaruz also had a feminist agenda and it was widely consumed, especially by young middle-class urban women in Iran. In 1966, three years after Iranian women were granted political rights, Zana Ruz was promoting a campaign which eventually led to the enactment of the Family Protection Law in 1967. For the purpose of improving women's legal rights in cases of divorce, child custody, and polygamy, Zana Ruz initiated a roundtable seminar con uh, concentrating on changes in the civil law in connection to family rights. The roundtable debate received an extensive... Okay. The roundtable debate received an extensive coverage in Zanaru's front pages for months. A total of 172 articles of the civil law were discussed through the seminar by four intellectual and leading public figures. The judge Ibrahim Adavi, the lawyer Dr. Muhammad Shekhar, member of the parliament, the lawyer and Iran's first woman's senator, Marangiz Manucherian, and the author and historian, Mohita Batabai. At the end of the seminar, 40 supplementary articles were drafted for the new bill. At the same time, Zane Ruz was conducting a poll among its readers by the use of coupons that were attached to the magazine. About 20,000 readers participated in the survey, and according to the magazine headlines, a total of 99% voted in favor of reforming women's legal rights in the family. Once the 40 articles were drafted, the magazine announced that it was planning on publishing parts of the book the, Natu the Natural Superiority of Women by the biological and social anthropologist Ashley Montague. The magazine was also planning on a series of articles by women writers and by Judge Madavi, all arguing for the expansion of women's legal rights in Iran. In this light, we can position Falsafi earlier mentioned phone call in a better context, since most of the law proposals in Zanaruz were perceived as contrary to the actual text of the Quran. Hence, the Zanaruz seminar for the expansion of women's legal rights displayed yet another challenge which the Khujatiya members saw fit to address. Whereas leading Shiite cleric were mostly engaged with deliberation of a theological nature, the spread of nationalist sentiments among the educated elite, the rapid modernization process, secular, secular religious establishment, the realization that the reaction of a different kind was extremely crucial. Therefore, on the winter of 1966, Falsafi called Ayatollah Mutaza Mutahari. In mid-1960s, 40 years old Mutahari already established 
the Islamic Council of the University of Students in Tehran delivered Islamic messages each week on Iranian national radio and delivered series of public lectures in both religious and secular institutions. He also wrote for the journal Maktab Islam under the guidance of Ayatollah Shariat Madari and Mutahari also edited the lectures of Ayatollah Tabatabai and even found time, imagine that, to publish several books of his own. More importantly, to our context, Mutari was rising as one of the prominent religious leaders who lectured on the need to recognize and change the direction of the Shiite clerical leadership. He was also insisting on the urgency of popularizing the Islamic philosophy in response to Western secular ideologies and in an attempt to reach the youth of the country. Accordingly, in 1965, he became one of the founders of the Husayniya Yashad. The Husayniya was a center of, for discussion. Okay. The Husayniya was a center for uh, discussion of modern Islam and might serve as an example of the outward changes that were taking place in the 1960s uh, in the teaching of Islam at the, at the time. Contrary to the mosque or to the madrasa, lecture in the Husaniyeh were delivered in a wide air-conditioned conference hall, similar to this one but a little bigger, and, had the, audi and the audience sat on comfortable chairs. Presentations were given by young university professors and engineers, early mentioned by Professor Bojardi, as well as religious leaders who uh, were in, interested in communicating with the teaching of uh, the teaching of Islam with, uh, in a new manner. Facilities were also available for slides and movies. Apart from Mutahari, the original members of the Husseiniya managing board included additional popular activists such as Said Hussein Nasser, Ezatullah Sahabi, and Ali Shariati. But by the time the regime closed down the institution, in the summer of 1973, Shariati was the only remaining founding member. But despite the split, the Husseiniya is said to have had a nationwide impact among the Iranian youth. Writing about the goals of the establishment, Mutari wrote in 1968, the new institution knows its task to answer the needs of the youth today and to introduce Islamic ideology to them. In light of Mutahari's activities to promote Islam through modern teaching methods among Iranian youth, it may not seem as a surprise that Falsafi found him as the perfect candidate to react on Zanir Ruse's proposal for the expansion of women's legal rights. Thus, Falsafi crucial phone call to Mutahari led to a meeting with the representative of the Daily Kehan and Zanerouz. At the end of its continuous deliberations, it was agreed that Judge Madhavi will write a series of articles in defense of the 40 supplementary articles, while Mutahari will make his own comments in light of Islamic law and the Quran. The magazine published Mutahari uh, Mutahari's articles on the opposite page alongside the, art, the response by Madhavi, without any interference or cuts. Under the heading Zanda Hukuke Islami, or Women in, in the System of Islamic Rights, Mutahari's first review was published in Zaniruz in October 1966. According to some commentators, in this debate, Judge Madhavi took mistook mistook Mutari as an ignorant mullah, who very shortly proved him wrong. Mutahari was not merely a mujtahid trained in mashhad and in qum. He participated in the liberations of the leading Islamic intellectuals, orthodox and liberals. He had studied under Sadr al-Din Sadr, Muhammad Khonsafi, Hussein Bukhari, Ukhala Khomeini, Mahdi Ishtiani, and Ayatollah Mazandrani. Under Tabatabai, his classmates included, among many others, Hussein Ali Muntazari and Musa Sadr. 
In addition, Mutari was also a PhD and a professor at the Tehran Theology, uh, Faculty of Theology. Okay. In his lectures and writings, challenging stagnant clergy, secular nationalist, secular Marxist, pseudo-religious left, and others to whom Islam served no more than a borrowed language. Mutaki's impressive background merely contributed to his scholarly preparations for his Anaru debate. Unfortunately, six months after the debate had started, Judge Madhavi died as a result of a heart attack. The kindest thing Mutahari could say about this misfortune was, and I quote, he was thus freeze, freed from writing the replies forever, end of quote. Despite the death of Madhavi, the debate aroused much interest with, the reader, uh, with readers who appealed to both Mutari and to the magazine. As a result, Mutari began publishing his own column, which lasted a total of 33 weeks. From his writings, okay. From his writings, it becomes apparent that Mutahari was well aware of his Zaneruz's column, that the content and the actual appearance of his articles in this particular magazine will raise few eyebrows. And I quote, when those people who do not know the background and who were not involved at the time hear that these articles were published for the first time in that particular magazine, they will certainly be surprised that I chose the above magazines for their publication. However, Mutare was also very grateful for the opportunity he was given to appeal to the younger members of the upper and upper middle class who were the target audience of Zaneruz at that time. Although he was a popular figure in Iran's religious and literary circles, Mutari's column earned him a much wider fame. In his column, Mutari discussed various issues such as engagement and proposals, fixed term marriage, women and social independence, Islam and modernization, the status of women in the Quran, self-respect and human rights, the natural foundations for family rights, the differences between women and men, maintenance, inheritance, divorce, and polygamy. In 1974, Mutahari's 33 magazine articles were collected and published in a book titled Women and Her Rights in Islam. Five years later, the Islamic Republic removed the Family Protection Law of 1967, and Mutahari's book on women's rights, along with the second volume, Mas'ele Hijab, or the veil question, came to shape the Islamic Republic ideology towards women and redefine the contours of the post-revolutionary gender discourse in Iran. As one of Khomeini's devoted students, Mutari became a prominent contributor to the student circles that played a key role in the 1979 revolution. But Mutari did not live long to witness the establishment of the Islamic Republic. On May Day, 1979, just three months following its emergence, Mutari was assassinated by the Furkan guerrilla organization. In the declaration issued by the organization, Mutari was accused of treason for having diverted the course of the revolution of the masses. At the time of his death, the 60 years old Mutahari was the chairman of the Secret Revolutionary Council which served as the guiding power of the new revolutionary government. In reference to Mutahari's gender legacy to post-revolutionary Iran, one might say that his ideas on women followed Muslim tradition quite closely, apart from several modifications on issues uh, such as the veil and fixed-term marriage. For Mutahari, whose wife was a school teacher, it was important to prove that Islam did not stand in the way of women's education, joining the workforce, and participate in social life. But at the same time, he did, however, call for sex segregation in workplace. In his writing on gender relations and roles, 
Motari main concern were, first and foremost, to defend all Muslim laws on the various mentioned subjects. In that respect, his stance was mostly apologetic, as he was attempting to explain the accidental gender biases which revealed by going back to the Sharia text. His second concern was to attack Western ideas of women and notions of women's liberation. In that respect, his stance was for most part oppositional, because at the particular time he was trying to resist the advance of Western values and lifestyle which were advocated by the monarchy and adopted by the secular elites. Within this context, we can say that Mutahari's major significance contribution was the method he used to prove his points which drew on rational and scientific rhetoric. Mutari, for example, used to quote and display data from Western scientists to prove that there were vast differences between men and women, such as biological and psychological differences, which are attributed to the laws of nature. Furthermore, he showed how Western scientists also pointed to differences in ability and need and concluded accordingly that different rights and duties in the family and in society at large should also be different. Since there was no shortage of sexist scientists and philosophers in the West, and I believe that we will agree with me, especially in the pre-politically correct era of the 1960s, Mutahari had no trouble in documenting his viewpoint. Based on that, Mutahari continued and suggested that with such explicit differences in nature, it would be unjust and in fact unpractical for the family and society if men and women were to have the same rights and the same duties. The kind of notion, okay, this kind of notion, as I already mentioned, became the pillars of the Islamic Republic gender ideology as the following example can show. And I quote, justice does not mean that all laws should be the same for women and men. The differences in body, height, certainness, voice, growth, muscle quality, physical strength, fitness in, face, in facing uh, disasters and resistance to disease in women and men show that men are stronger and more capable in all these areas. Men brand, brains are larger, um, et cetera, et cetera. These differences accordingly affect the, uh, the rights uh, and uh, responsibilities uh, of men and women uh, in society. Uh, now, I don't know if uh, anyone of you know, but this was uh, declared by okay, President Rafsanjani in 1986. Another example of a similar notion We can also find in the words of Masoum Ebtekar, former vice president for environmental protection under Mohammed Khatami, and I quote the text before you, one should take psychological and legal affairs of the society into consideration as well. If the regular rules of family are broken, it would result in, uh, in many uh, complicated and grave consequences uh, for the entire society. For summation, Mutahari's writing on women are contradictory and problematical, and hence controversial. While some commentators hold that the, that, uh, the view uh, that he uh, painted, I'm sorry, while some uh, commentators hold that the view that he had painted uh, was uh, a rosy picture in defense of Islam and his treatment of women, and moreover, he glorified gender inequality by arguing that it is in harmony with the law of nature, others consider, consider his viewpoint on women to be more egalitarian than other uh, leading clerics of his time, such as his mentor, Ayatollah Khomeini. By exploring the episode of Ayatollah Mutahari column in Zanaruz, I wish to show how commercial magazine became a central platform for the popularization of the Shia Islamic discourse on women in pre-revolutionary Iran. 
This notion, along with Mutari's uh, precedent in Zanarouz, increased the willingness of other clerics to acknowledge and address sensitive, sensitive social problems in modern day media. While most of Middle Eastern countries today initially find it very difficult to acknowledge, let alone address, sensitive social problems such as teenage runaways, violence in the family, drug addiction, high-risk behavior, crime and prostitution, the Islamic Republic is showing an openness nowadays to discuss to discuss formally taboo issues in popular media as indicated in the recent issues of the magazine Zanan. And this uh, I can elaborate in uh, my next lecture. <laughs> Thank you. I know we're running late, yeah, but ten minutes. ten minutes. Okay. Questions, comments? I can take them off. Virginia. <laughs> yeah, no, we're okay. Uh, questions, comments? I saw somebody say, yeah. Question. Um, I and louder. louder, I cannot even hear you. Because those were done for the part, the, the examples that I showed you, you referring to the examples, those particular examples? Just in general. In general. I don't know of any really outside Iran for, but for the Muslim nations, you know, um, I always collect images. Um, I have seen that for example, that's a, for the uh, promotion of the Islam as being um, for the women, for the women's rights, you know, and there is, you know, emancipated women and Islam. There are a lot of um, posters and, you know, uh, images, but not like only for Islamic Republic, outside Iran I'm talking about. Because we always have this debate that a uh, you know submissive character in uh, you know she doesn't know anything. But no, there are a lot of lot of images that is contradicts that outside Iran for the Muslim nations. Okay, so what was the next question? But excuse me, I think you meant you're supported by Iran or by Irani. Um, oh, if, if it's supported by, the, <coughs> by Iran, you will, um, I think Iranian uh, government supports magazines. There are some that are publishers outside Iran. They have also online magazines, and there are also, the, um, since we don't have any embassy in the United States, I don't know if the government of Iran doing anything through their own other, you know, facilities in the United States, but I know in the European countries, probably through the embassies, you know, they have some propaganda and so forth. Um, but not to the extent that these posters and images for, you know, um, which help the revolution inside Iran. I mean, I don't know if I'm still answering your question or not. I was thinking more of the influence that these images would have on, like, the images of, like, Hezbollah or something like this. 
Oh, I, I cannot answer you. <laughs> I don't know. I really don't know. And what, you had any other question? I mean, the, uh, your question was long, but so you yeah. caught it. Yeah, there are differences. Um, the Iranian images usually they try to show that the women are active participants doing all kinds of stuff. I don't know if you're aware um, of the uh, sports images. Yeah. Uh, you know, like the, um, they were banned to participate in public sports events. And the daughter of Rafsanjani, who's very, very active, and she's a sports person herself, and I think she recently she just finished her PhD. She was the one who made it possible um, to have an Olympic of all Muslim women's nations in Iran. And Iran is the only country which hosts it because legally they can qualify. Um, besides Iran would be Saudi Arabia that they have not agreed to do it yet because of the, uh, the, the issue of hijab. Mm -hmm. okay? Iran is the only country who, according to those code and code restrictions, can implement, you know, the rules. And the very first time they had it, um, they had only 70 countries participant. Now it's 121 countries participant, and they're still doing it. Mm -hmm. So the whole argument was they, they used that um, argument that um, we are powerful women. We're doing this for ourselves. We're not doing it to show off to men. We don't need men to photograph us. We don't need men to, uh, you know, be there with their cameras. We want to compete, and we want to compete at the international level. So for those, you know, they will have um, not images, posters anywhere, but it's internally advertised, and those people who will follow those games, the tickets are sold to only female spectators, the only time there are photographs is at the beginning of the game before they get into the, you know, performance clothing. So they are, when they are, um, you know, uh, having the par uh, parade, uh, there are photographs. And then the photographers are allowed at the award ceremonies. So at, under no circumstances, any men would be witnessing the performance. But they are fine, and they are really, really sticking to it. Um, President Rafsanjani um, was trying to kind of boycott this last event, um, and the argument was it cost Iran a lot, and we cannot, you know, chip in every time that they want to have this sports. But I think they still agreed to do it. Mm -hmm. But I, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, my impression was that the Islamic Women's Olympics for one of a better term, I forget what they exactly yeah, call it. Islamic yeah, the Islamic Women's Olympics. Um, with all the um, uh, restrictions that you uh, mentioned, uh, still projected a, a very strong image, at least to the Muslim world, maybe not outside. And I think they also had stamps. You mentioned stamps. I think they had stamps I for the... I have not seen the stamps. They have, they have published books. Okay, on the second anniversary and third anniversary and so forth. So they will have the uh, name. I haven't seen the stamps. Mm -hmm. um, but they will have, you know, po um, photographs uh, in the books. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I don't know if they had, you know, posters plastered mm -hmm. anywhere. They really didn't want this to be advertised just like the women, you know, foreign women's now coming. So it gave one little space. You know, and then they're also watchful. If you make a little mistake that is taken away from you, and they have to bargain so much to get it back. For example, riding bicycles for women became forbidden because she rides a saddle. Okay? So, how they uh, accomplish getting that back, it took years. And then it became the issue where she's going to ride the bikes. Well, the whole idea was reserve the parks for us, have certain days, certain time, we ride the bikes. And they're sticking to it. 
So after it was okay to ride the bikes, now they are riding scooters. <laughs> so you just have to, you have, with Iranian politics, you have to be patient. Nothing will happen overnight. So it's just, you do one little thing and it leads itself to another thing. But the problem is, if you make a mistake on that initial thing, you will be banned. You will be forgotten, you know, and, and for a long time you have to battle to get it back. Mm -hmm. On this advertisement, I guess since they have those women in the international games, they become an ambassador to their own country. As a matter of fact, they are used as examples. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because in the sport issues, there were some fatwas on the Muslim women who participated with shorts in, in some events. And then the clerks, like from South Asia, they gave an example. What can't you be like the Islamic uh, Republic of Iran and dress decently? And, you know, mm -hmm. it leads to so many other things. Yeah. Um, I wanted to make a comment, but... If, if there are questions, I see to the audience because we can talk later. <coughs> questions, comments? Yeah. Uh, Professor Shirazi, I would like to ask you, you talked about the, uh, the image of women in connection to the Iran-Iraq war. What about women in the war or in the army? Was there any... They were not in a very active army, but they served kind of uh, on the side of the army. We had the nurses, we had the... Uh, you know, but they were, they had the training, but they never went to the front. We have kind of a, what do we call it that, Kaharan uh, Zainab, uh, kind of a, they're like cops, yeah, no, you know, so. they're like cops, they carry guns and they're kind of yeah. more policing women, you know, but they did not participate in the combat. Yeah. Um, they have a different kind of a, you will see them sometimes once in a while, uh, the images with the guns and, yeah, and parading and all that. But it's only show. It's a you show. Know, it's a show. It's, a, it's more of a support, mental support, mm -hmm. than really in an active, you know, participation. Yeah. And are there, sorry, could I just add yeah. one word to this? So, do you know of any discussion whether the fact women hold guns, for example, maybe it could be... Uh, uh, perceived as even more, I don't know, a blasphemy, so to speak, than a woman riding a bicycle. I mean, no, 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 be no, because the guns are, are through the okay and the blessing and the halal yeah. of, of the government, you know, so that cannot be, it cannot be yeah. wrong. <laughs> no, and what? Yeah. No, also there's Nusayba bin Kaab and, and there are role models. But they're not active world. militant, you know, in the front, but they do have the training. Was there any change once the front, again, the cities in Iran actually became the front once the cities were bombed? Was there any change? Change in treating of women. In, in terms of the women? Uh, I mean, what kind of change? If, okay. Uh, if we're talking during the 80s, uh -huh. there were changes in the war. At the time that men were going to the battlefield, mm -hmm. but once the cities, the main cities, became like bombed by the Iraqis, were there any changes in the images of women? Oh, uh, the home became the, became the front. The, the whole <laughs> idea is um, uh, the, the change that they had to go through is in the lifestyle you're talking about, change in the lifestyle, in the images, in the, images. In the oh, they were, they were, they were more, they were more martyrdom and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, the one thing that you have to understand also is the diversion of the idea of the pop popular idea or the idea of if there is a, a battle on the borders, okay, and it is very popular, I mean, somebody can do that on the uh, newspapers, if you, if you dig into the newspapers. Any time that Iranian government was losing territory to the Iraqi uh, um, military, they would be at the case of the women more. So it's just like a diversion of the ideas of the, of the whole psychic. If, if they are losing battles, then they will be chasing women for their hijab. For they are, uh, you know, they have to be restricted with the hijab. Pardon what? me?
<laughs> <laughs> no, it is just like you divert all of a sudden in the front pages of the newspapers, you will see how many they have arrested, where they have gone, where they have pulled them in, and what's their crime, okay? So that will, because every man is connected to a woman. <laughs> see? It, it's, it's really, it's, it's a very genius way to divert. Okay, now I'm not worried about what's happening in the front. I'm worried about where there is my daughter is today. You know, if she's going to be arrested for bad hijabi or not. So it, I think they had to play that role to just kind of keep the population quiet because there was a lot of loss uh, of the youth of Iran, you know. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Just one Things somebody, I mean, just very briefly, uh, some, I think one of the questions was, is there a difference in the uh, uh, iconography, iconography of um, uh, Iran and other Muslim countries? I can only speak for the Middle East, and for sure, you know, based on not placards, but mostly films that I've seen, the Egyptian religious films, uh, comic books, school books, everything that has visual material, cartoons and things like that. Undoubtedly, there is a, is a difference between the Iranian uh, images and the, um, uh, and I want to be careful here, the Sunni Arab it, uh, images, uh, the ones that I've examined anyway. But um, I want to thank the speakers, thank all of you, and we have a...